Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the privilege of coming before you every time. Thank you, Lord, because you've given us Jesus Christ, who leads us to you, and who reconciles us with the Almighty. Lord, we pray at this time you speak your word to every heart, even today in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that your word that you speak to us will fall on fertile ground. Amen. Will bring forth fruit, thirty fold, sixty fold, and a hundred fold in Jesus' name. Amen. That our time in your presence will be an enriching time. Amen. Will be a joyful time. Amen. Will be a time to experience more of the Lord in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless us, Lord. Amen. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're reading from Psalm 85, verse 6. Psalm 85, verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Here is a psalm talking about revival. And this psalm is asking a question. Asking a question from the Lord. And obviously, the question is being asked by somebody that knows the history of the children of Israel. That knew how God had brought revival, excitement, the presence of God, and the mighty manifestation of that power that always comes with the presence of God. That's why he was asking the question. He said, O Lord, mighty God, the God of life, and the God of restoration, the God of power, will you not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in you? Obviously, the word again means that revival had been before. And then, to ask the question, will you not revive us again? It's giving the impression, it's giving the indication that at that time, when the psalmist was risen up, this urgent prayer unto the Lord. There was no revival in Israel at that time. That's why he said, Oh Lord, we saw it before. We knew it before. We experienced it before. We enjoyed it before. We spoke about it before. Everybody saw it. And everybody rejoiced in that mighty manifestation of the power of God. In the land of the people of God in the past. And he's saying, Oh Lord, is it all gone? Is it all evaporated away and we don't have any hope anymore? Will you not revive us again? Do it again, O oh Lord. And then he said, it's only at that time that the people of God will rejoice so that we can rejoice in thee. We're looking at the word of God about the believers at cry for revival. Believers at cry for revival. If you are a real child of God, there is something your heart is crying out to God for. And it is for revival. And if your family, husband, wife, and children, if you know the Lord, if you are born again, and if you are really children of God, and you have tasted of the grace of God, of the goodness of God, of the abundance, of the manifestation of the favor of God upon your family in the past, and you know it's not exactly like that today. You're asking the same question that the psalmist was asking. Oh Lord, here is our family, a Christian family, who have a body in our heart, a desire, a passion, and Lord, this is what we want. We want those old good days to come back again. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in thee? If you have been in a church for some time and you have experienced times of major outbreak or breakthrough of the presence and of the fulfillment of the promises of God and you have seen how God works in such a dynamic way in our midst and you are hearing how God is doing great, great things in the lands beyond our land. And the Lord is still moving. And His power is still very much at work. Then as you look around you, and as you look at your community, you are asking, oh Lord, here we are. 
as the presence of God, as the power of God, as the favor of God, as the fire of revival, totally, completely, forever shifted unto all the lands, will you not revive us again? That your people may rejoice in thee. That should be the question or the passion or the desire in every heart today. Look at that again in chapter 85 of the Psalms. Verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Obviously as you look at that question. You'll see the mind of the psalmist. It was saying, our joy is limited. Why the time of revival delays? Our joy is a little bit restrained. While the period of the breakthrough for revival is delayed, and while revival tires, we cannot rejoice. As well to rejoice. That's why he's saying, oh Lord, I want to rejoice. But the joy of heaven coming upon our soul and that joy can only come in an unlimited way unsurpassing manner in a way that will overflow and our hearts will not be able to contain that's when you come upon us O oh lord like in the days of old and revive us again will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in thee Obviously, number one, let's talk about the desire for revival. Number one, desire for revival. The psalmist is saying, here is our desire. Here is our dream. Here is what we are asking for. Here, oh Lord, this is the very center of what we want today. Didn't you say, oh Lord, through your only begotten son, that whatsoever you desire for when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. Here is our desire. That Lord, you revive us again. The desire for revival. What's revival? Number two. The description of revival. When that revival comes, how do we know? Are we going to be able to gauge? Are we going to be able to tell that what we're praying for is exactly what the Lord has given us? Let me show you the description of revival from the experience of Samson. In Judges chapter 15. Judges chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 18 and verse 19 Judges 15 reading from verse 18 and he was so assessed and he called on the Lord and said thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. You see, Samson had a great victory. He had a great success. But in the midst of that success, he lacked something very important, something very essential. He needed water to drink, and he was dying of thirst. Then he said, O oh Lord, he prayed unto the Lord. He said, You have given me this great victory. Here is great success, but I'm dying of thirst, and I will fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God claimed and hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. His spirit came again, and he revived. That's revival. When you are dry, thirsty, in a spiritual famine, and it appeared that what you needed spiritually is getting farther and farther away from you. And you are wondering, when will my thirst, my desire, my passion for the glory of the Lord be satisfied? And then all of a sudden, a miraculous breakthrough. A major breakthrough. And the Lord gives you the water of life that refreshes your heart and your spirit and your life. Revival comes. Dryness goes away. Weariness goes away. Despair goes away. Your desperation for the presence of God is satisfied. That is revival. Number three, demand for revival. You have a desire. 
We have described that revival. And then now you have the demand. You are praying for it. Habakkuk chapter 3. In Habakkuk chapter 3, we are looking at verse 2. Habakkuk chapter 3, we are looking at verse 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech. I was afraid. O Lord, revive thy word in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. Here the prophet was praying. And here the people of God ought to pray. If you don't understand what's going on around you, if you care less, you are careless about what is going on around you, you will not know that the demand of today, the request of today, the prayer today, should be the prayer for revival. It says, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech, and I was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. Look at the work of God. If you start from the house fellowship, the glory of the house fellowship, the joy in the house fellowship, and the light in the house fellowship, and the love in the house fellowship, and the interaction in the house fellowship, and the flowing of mercy one to the other in the house fellowship, where is it today? How is the house fellowship today compared with the house fellowship in the past? Or you look at among the believers. The joy of being a believer and interaction among believers, the trust and the confidence and the love and the fellowship among the believers. Look at it today. How is it? Or you look at any other area of the world. Among the children, children getting saved, children living the life of true salvation, and their parents knowing, having the joy. If my boy, if my daughter does not have any other sin, my child has real biblical scriptural salvation that will take a person to heaven. Where is it today? Or among the young people with all the programs and everything that we're doing, laboring here, laboring there. Where is the life? The life of Christ. Genuine conversion and commitment to the word of God. And you look at the lives of the children of members of the church in comparison with the children of, uh, of those whose parents are not here. The seriousness, the devotion, the dedication to the things of the Lord. Look at that area of the youth work. You'll be praying, you'll be demanding like Habakkuk, O oh Lord, in the midst of the years, revive thy work. Look at the women ministry. And look at all the things that we're doing. Every section of the work area in the church of the Lord. And you'll be praying like Habakkuk, O oh Lord, I've had thy speech. And I was afraid. And then he said, O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. Number four, desperation for revival. When you are desperate, you say, Lord, we must have revival. We must have revival. If we don't have revival, how is this how we're going to end a Christian life or a Christian journey? We started so well and it was so great at the beginning. But now, Lord, we want an outbreak of a fire of revival, desperation for revival. In Psalm 63, Psalm 63, I'm reading from verse 1. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in a sanctuary. And you know that's, that's the desperation you find in the heart, in the life of the psalmist. Where you become that desperate. And you say, Lord, I don't want to be lukewarm. As we get nearer and nearer to the coming of the Lord, I want to be on fire for the Lord. I want the thirst and the passion of my soul to be something that is leading me. 
and pushing me and driving me towards God more and more. I am thirsty to see thy presence and thy power. The inspiration for revival. Number five, dedication for revival. If you are that desperate, you want to dedicate, consecrate, surrender. Anything and everything so that there will be this mighty, wonderful revival. Psalm 73. Reading from verse 23. Psalm 73, verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holding me by thy right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. And afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth. But God is the strength of my heart. And my portion forever. You dedicate everything, you give everything, then you have that revival. If that's the case, there's going to be a decision. Number six, decision for revival. In Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Multitudes, multitudes. In the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Actually, that passage is not just talking about revival alone. It's talking about multitudes coming together and deciding with one mind, one heart, one soul, and one attention. And you say, this is what we want. In the case of the church, if there's anything we should take decision about, it is the decision to have revival. And we're telling the Lord, Oh Lord, when will it be? Let this be a day. Let this be a time. Before we're called home to glory. Let us see the fullness and the fulfillment of your promise to your people so we can have revival. Decision for revival. When that revival eventually comes, how do you see it? How do you recognize it? Number seven, the demonstration of revival. The demonstration of revival. In 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 21. 1 Kings 18. Verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. If you're a Bible student, a Bible Christian, you know this story. There had been famine for about three and a half years. And eventually Elijah showed up. Elijah said, how do you love this? How do you appreciate this? The dryness. The famine. The limitations, the need among the people of God. Here is what idol worship has led you to. Here is what looking away from God has led you to. Now our land is dry. Then he said, but there's still hope. But you are going to make up your mind and take a decision. If God be God, serve him. If Baal, then serve him. And the people answered him, not a word. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, the challenge eventually came. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. And let them choose one bullock from, for themselves. And cut it in pieces. And lay it on the wood. And put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock. And lay it on wood. And put no fire under. And call you on the name of your gods. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, 
let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Elijah threw out a challenge. He said, the prophets of Baal are many. I am the only one I know remaining, serving the true God. Now, let them take their bullock, put each on the altar, but put no fire under. And let's see, the God that will answer by fire to consume the sacrifice, that is the God we're going to serve. And the people said, that's all right. That's a good deal. That's a good challenge. We accept that. We love that. Verse 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And he took the bullock, which was given them, and he dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered. And he leaped upon the altar, which was made. And it came to pass at noon, that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God, either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is on a journey. By adventure he sleepeth, and must be awake. And they cried aloud, and caught themselves after their manner with knives and lances, till the blush gushed out upon them. And it came to pass, when the midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. The gods of Baal failed them. And they knew this could not be God. Now we come to Versace. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And of the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as will contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid upon and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and put it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran, ran round about the altar. And he filled a trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That's revival. 
The minds and the hearts and the souls of the people were turned back to God again. That's exactly what Elijah prayed for. He said, Lord, let this be done. That the people of Israel may know. I've done this according to your word. And that you turn their hearts back to yourself again. And when that was done, the people cried out, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Revival began. I pray that mighty revival will come in our midst in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's going to be the case, there will be desire. If that's going to be the case, there will be a demand. If that's going to be the case, there will be a desperation. A dedication, a decision, and then there will be a demonstration of revival in our midst in Jesus' name. I divide the message of three parts. Remember, we're talking on the believer's heart cry. The believer's heart cry for revival. Number one, proper perception of true spiritual revival. Proper perception. Proper perception of true spiritual revival. Number two, personal preparation for true spiritual revival. Personal preparation. Personal preparation for true spiritual revival. Number three, practical proof of true spiritual revival. Let's come to number one. The proper perception of true spiritual revival. Revival. We look at Genesis chapter 45. In Genesis chapter 45, reading verse 27. Genesis chapter 45, verse 27. And he told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him. His spirit, that is the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. His spirit revived. The spirit of Jacob revived. If you want to understand revival, you look at such passages containing the word revive, revived, reviving, or revival. You learn, you learn about Jacob. You remember the time that Joseph was sent to look at the welfare of his brothers. Meanwhile, his brothers hated him because of his dream. And because he had related to them the dream that the Almighty God had given to him. But Joseph was a real child of God. He didn't have any hatred, any malice in his heart. All he had was love and fellowship, and obedience to his father on earth, and obedience to the God of heaven. And then when the father said, Joseph, come up, go and look at your brothers and see how they do. And then he went joyfully, happily, while he was going. You remember the story, he missed them. He didn't know where they were. He asked somebody that he found, where are these my brothers? And he said, in such and such a place. Then he was going to see them. While he was coming from afar, they said, here comes the dreamer. Pick him up. Kill him. And kill his dream. And we'll see what becomes of him. Then he got to them. They removed the clothes. Eventually they sold him to the Ishmaelites. After selling him to the Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelites sold him unto the Egyptians. Then they killed a goat. And dip the clothes in the blood. And then they went to their father and they said, Here is what we found. Can you tell whether this belongs to your son or not? And Jacob recognized the clothes and he said, Here is the clothes of Joseph. No doubt a wild animal had killed my son. He is gone. I am going to die to you. He became depressed. He got into despair. And he said, I will never see my son again. In that condition, they tried to comfort him. They couldn't comfort him. Eventually, after a long story, after many years, these brothers knew that there was food in Egypt. And they went to Egypt. And then at the second time, he revealed himself unto them. When he revealed himself to them, you know the story. Eventually, they said, go and call my father. And go and tell my father, there is sustenance here. There is plenty here. There is no famine here. I'll feed you. And I will feed all your families. 
And then they came to uh, Jacob, their father. They said, Joseph is still alive. That's unbelievable. I cannot trust you on that. I cannot believe that. And then they showed him everything they got from Jacob. And they told him the whole story. How they saw him, how he spoke to them. And I said, we must come and bring you. And he'll take care of you in this old age. Then the depression went away. The discouragement went away. The despair went away. His spirit came again. That's revival. When all your depression is gone. When your despair is gone. When your discouragement is gone. When life and delight and joy comes once again from the presence of the Lord to your soul. And now you are revived. You are now alive. Alive with the strength and the life of God in you. That's revival. All the hopelessness in your life is gone. And then the joy of the Lord now replaces that in your life. That is revival. First Kings chapter 17. In First Kings chapter 17, we're looking at verse 17 and verse 22. First Kings chapter 17, verse 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And the sickness was so sore, was so great, that there was no breath left in him. That's another way of saying he died. But then eventually, the, the mother of that child, the dead child, appealed to Elijah. And he said, look at my condition. What are you going to do for me? In verse 22, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Elijah prayed. And the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. There was death, but now death is cancelled, and there is life. That's revival. When the spiritual death, and when the spiritual lukewarmness, and spiritual coldness, and then we come to the Lord, and he injects and infuses the life of God. The life of Christ into our soul, into our spirit. And we come alive in God. And come alive in the Lord. That is revival. No death anymore. No spiritual death anymore. But life has taken the place of spiritual death. That is revival. Second Kings chapter 13. In Second Kings chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. And Elisha died... And they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. In verse 21, it came to pass. As they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a bunch of men. And they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. When the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived. He revived and he stood up upon his feet. You get the understanding now. You have the understanding now when somebody has died. And now he comes to life again. That's revival. And when you have died spiritually, you have lost the vitality of real life, of the Christian life, and the joy of the Christian life. And it's like you are dead, you are cold, and you are sluggish, and you are dragging your feet, and you've lost all interest in spiritual matters. But now the power of the Spirit of God comes into you, or you have contact with the Spirit of God, and then you come back to life, and you have your interest again, the inspiration again, the influence again, the power again. That is revival. We're told in uh, Romans chapter 14, proper perception of true spiritual revival. In Romans chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 9. Romans chapter 14, verse 9. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived. Christ died. Then on the day of resurrection, the power of God from heaven came to that grave. Rolled the stones away. New life came. He rose from the dead. He revived. That he might be the Lord. Both of the dead 
and of the living. Ezra chapter 9. In Ezra chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 8 and verse 9. Ezra chapter 9, verse 8. Now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape. And to give us a nail in a holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. The people of God were in bondage, they were in spiritual captivity. And now the Lord gave them a way of escape, and they escaped from their bondage. And then Ezra interpreted that to mean the Lord has given us a little reviving. In verse 9, for we were born men, and our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. But he has extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us a reviving. The bondage that was gone, the yoke that was broken, the oppression that was removed. And the Lord released them into the land of liberty. And he called that reviving. To set up the house of our God. And to repair the desolations thereof. And to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. That's revival. If we come back to that passage we read in First Kings chapter, uh, First Kings chapter 18. You see what revival is. When the fire of God falls from heaven. And the people, they recognize that this is the very presence of God in their very midst. And they all turn en masse as a multitude, turning away from idolatry, turning away from Baal worship. And they turn to God completely. That is revival. What's revival then? Revival is hope springing up in the place of hopelessness. Revival is spiritual life blossoming after periods of spiritual death, coldness, and lukewarmness. Revival is when zeal and passion and consecration replace inactivity and lack of interest among the people of God. When the Lord makes us to become heavenly minded instead of being absorbed in earthly things. How do we prepare for revival? Point number two. Personal preparation for true Spiritual revival. Personal preparation for true spiritual revival. In Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6. Reading from verse 1. As we desire revival. As we demand for revival. As we are asking the Lord to give us revival. To send revival to us. We have a part to play. And we need to do our part. And it's when we do our part, the Lord then will do his part and give us revival. Hosea chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return unto the Lord. Come, let us return unto the Lord. For he has turned, and he will heal us. He has smitten. And he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. But you see what precedes that revival. He says, come. Come. Let us return unto the Lord. You look at where you are today spiritually. You look at the way you have quiet time. You look at your interest in reading the Bible. You look at your excitement in following the Lord. And you look at the joy with which you obey the Lord. And you say, uh-uh. It's not like it used to be. The excitement, the joy, the life, the interest, the passion, the zeal that you used to have. You see that it was not, it's not like it used to be. And then the Lord is saying, don't you want revival? Don't you want a restoration of that fire? A restoration of that zeal? A restoration of that passion? You say, yes, that's what I want. He says, then come, let us return unto the Lord. For he has turned and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know. If we follow on, she know. 
to know the Lord. It says, if we follow on to know the Lord more and more, you know the Lord in restoration. He restores you. And then, you know the Lord in purification. He sanctifies you. You say, there's still more. I want to know the Lord more, the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. And then you experience Him more. And even after that, you still want an overflowing of the gifts and the grace of the Spirit of God upon your life. Then shall we know, if we follow on, you know the Lord is going forth, is prepared as the morning, and He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. Personal preparation coming back fully with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your desires. You come back unto the Lord fully. Then the time of revival will come again. In Isaiah chapter 57 from verse 15. Isaiah chapter 57 from verse 15. For thus says the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place. And with him also that's of a contrite and humble spirit. Of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble. To revive the spirit of the humble. What does that mean? We need to humble ourselves before the Lord. Then he will revive us because he revives the spirit of the humble. And then in verse 15 it says, And to revive the heart of the contrite ones. If we are contrite, if we are tender, if we accept and receive the word of God, and then we turn in the right direction he wants us to turn, after receiving the word of God, then it says, He will revive us. When it says we are to be humble, it tells us the implication of that in Second Chronicles chapter seven verse fourteen. Second Chronicles chapter seven, reading from verse fourteen, the prerequisite or the condition or the things we need to prepare ourselves for or prepare ourselves through before we are revived. In Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 If my people which are called by my name Shall humble themselves You know revival will not come Except we are humble We realize where we are today We realize where we used to be We realize where we are coming from We realize the good old days The good old days of the revival of faith The revival of holiness The revival of power the revival of soul winning, the revival of fellowship, the revival of love. Remember the good old days when the presence of God, the power of God was tangible. You could almost sense it and feel it. And everybody knew the Lord is in this place indeed. When those newcomers came and while we were going through the worship, they were being convicted of their sin and they were giving their lives to the Lord and getting born again. When people were coming to the church, getting born again in every service, not waiting for a special time because of the revival fire, born in every time. And the Lord is saying, since that is the mind we have and the desire that we have and the passion that we have and the goal that we have, that we want revival today, says yes, revival can come. When the people of God prepare themselves, if my people are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and then turn, they turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. When we obey and do what the Lord is telling us to do, a time of revival will come. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2. Not only to repent, but to request. Not only to turn away from what we have been doing that is hindering the days of revival speedily coming back, but to pray unto the Lord. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 1 verse 2. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. The prayer is not only for the people who are members of the church, but for the ministers as well. The prayer of the prophet and the prayer of the people. The prayer of the preacher, the pastor, and the prayer of the members of the church. O oh Lord, in verse 2, I have heard thy speech. I have heard thy speech. 
when we hear the word of God, like we're hearing now, on the need for revival, on the possibility of revival. And that this is what the Lord wants to do. He wants to revive us. And the prophet said, O oh Lord, I've had a speech and was afraid. When the word of God has an impact on us, and we say we're afraid to remain dry like this. We're afraid to remain without the visitation of the mighty God once again in our midst. We're afraid that the fire of revival will shift to all the cities, all the nations, all the lands. Oh Lord, we've heard your speech. And we are afraid. Then he said, Oh Lord, revive thy work. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. That's how God revives his people. When we call upon the Lord, we say, oh Lord, this is what we want. This is what we desire. And that desire, the Lord will fulfill it. In Psalm 138, Psalm 138. Verses 6, 7, and 8. Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord be high, yet as he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. If there's pride in our heart, there will be no revival. If there's self-satisfaction, I have enough. We have enough. Nothing wrong with us. Everything is all right. We can never be as, as more powerful than what we are today. We cannot be higher, greater than what we are today. We are all right the way we are. If that's our mind, that's pride. When the Lord is saying, you need more of him. You need his power. You need the fire power to come upon your soul and to shake everything shakeable and to burn everything that's not bringing glory to God. If we just sit back and say, but what's wrong with us? We live decent lives. We live honorable lives. And we live peaceful lives. Everything is all right. Revival will not come in that way. It's a heart that is passionate. It's a heart that is desirous. It's a heart that is longing. It's a heart that is saying, oh Lord, we're not where we ought to be. We're not even where we used to be. And we're not what we ought to be. Do it again, oh Lord. Open the heavens. Pour down your power and refresh your people again. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost come upon the people of God again. That is when that revival will come. And it will come in Jesus' name. In verse 7, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. You know, if you have the right attitude and you are telling the Lord, O oh Lord, this is what we want. Revival from on high. It says even though I've been walking in the, in the place in the midst of trouble. Yet you will revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thy hand against the wrath of mine enemies. And thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. It comes at the time of revival. You know, you cannot be lukewarm and say, While I am lukewarm, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Never. You cannot remain in a backsliding condition and say, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me never. You cannot remain on the ivory tower of pride and say, The Lord will revive and will perfect that which concerneth me. It is when we humble ourselves, when we seek the face of the Lord, when we seek Him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and we're telling the Lord, Oh Lord, we want revival at all costs, and we pray for that revival, then we can be sure the Lord will, will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endure it forever. Forsake not the works of thine hand. If we're going to have the revival, there are things we have to do. We cannot be passive. We cannot be inactive and then expect that revival will come. Now, what does it mean then to have revival? Number one, remember past experiences of revival. Remember past experiences of revival. Remember how it used to be. Remember those days of old when the interest was high, when the zeal was great, when the passion was unsurpassable. When the peace of God flowed like a river. Remember that time when we had the fullness 
of the Spirit of God in manifestation. Not only from the pulpit, also from the pew. Remember the past. Number two, repent of present evidence of retrogression. Repent of present evidence of retrogression. That is, you look at your lifestyle today. You look at your Christian life today and you ask yourself, in which way have I retrogressed? That is, have I gone back? Have I returned to a little bit of what I used to be in my carnal nature, in my worldly nature, in my old nature? In what way have I gone back from the word of his more repent? A present evidence of retrogression. Number three, read a present day expressions of revival. Read, get interested, and read of present day expressions of revival. See God moving in mighty ways, here and there and there, and hear what God is doing, and read about that. And sometimes when we have reports in our life magazine or reports in any of our literature, that you read all those things. And then as you read, you begin to desire, I want this in my life. I want this in my soul. And then in, uh, number, four, uh, number four is to repair the altar of prayer and worship. Repair the altar of prayer and worship. Do you see when I read to you how Elijah brought that revival back? Uh, look at uh, first, uh, Kings again, chapter 18. First Kings... Chapter 18, verse 30. And Elijah said unto the people, Come near unto me. Why did he say, Come near unto me? Well, he said, Come near because we are farther away. He said, Come near because Elijah actually had a different mind from the people. You know, when the people have begun to see Elijah was a bad man, was a terrible prophet. He lodged the heavens. And there had not been rain for three and a half years. And he took the key away. And Ahab had been looking for Elijah. Where is Elijah? Where is Elijah? Obadiah, come on, follow me. Let's look for this man. And eventually God said, Elijah, go and show yourself to Ahab. And then he found Obadiah. He said, go and tell your master, Elijah is here. And Obadiah said, me? You want me to lose my life? There is, no, there is no place where Ahab, the king, had not been searching. He wanted you at all costs. And if I go and tell Ahab that you are there, the Spirit of God will take you away. I will not know where you have gone. And then I will lose my life. And he said, no, I'm going to show myself to Ahab. And eventually he came and he said, I found Elijah. You found him? And then Elijah showed up. When Ahab saw Elijah, he said, Thou art the one that troubles Israel. You are a troublemaker. You are the cause of our problem. You have taken the key of heaven and there is no rain. And Elijah said, you are the one troubling Israel, telling Ahab. That's the mind of the people. They were far away from him. And they felt he was a bad man. He was a bad prophet. He is causing all this problem. And it was their sin that caused the problem. And eventually he said, now come near unto me. Can it be so like that with us here? That we are being, we are going farther and farther apart from the leadership to the membership. From the coordinators to the members of the local church. That now we need fellowship. You come near together. All the wall of partition and the demarcation and the things that separate us and the things that pull us far apart. Different idea. Different opinion different direction, different interests, and different aspiration. We put all those differences aside. If we're going to have revival, Elijah said, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. All the people without exception. That's how revival comes. If there is malice, if there is hatred, if there is division, if there is suspicion, if there is a coming farther and farther apart, if uh, our iniquities separate us from God and separate us from one another, revival will never come. But it's when the people come near and all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. We come to the Lord and we repair the altar of 
prayer and worship. And we understand how sacred prayer is. And we understand how sacred worship is. And all the things were brought in, into the times of prayer, into the times of worship, that actually nauseates God, that actually repels God, that makes God to feel, are these people praying to me? Or are they doing another thing? All those things will take away and repair the altar of prayer and worship. And then it says, and Elijah took 12 stones. In repairing the altar of the Lord, he took 12 stones, and the Bible is clear there, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, so that he will do everything according to the word of the Lord, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And of the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as will contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him upon the wood, and set fuel for barrels of water, and pour it on the bond sacrifice and on the wood. Do it again the second time, that's four times, four barrels, second time, and he did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time, and he did it the third time, four times three, that's twelve again. You see this man, you see this prophet, he did everything according to the word of the Lord. That's how to have revival. You cannot have revival when you have God's word and man's opinion all mingled together. You'll not have revival when you have God's word and personal ideas all mixed together. That's not how to have revival. If we want revival, we're going to push aside all personal opinion, all personal ideas. All traditional ideas, all the things, you know, this is what I want. I know it's not in the Bible, but add it for me. This is what I desire. I know it's not according to the doctrine of the Bible, but it just put it there for me. I love that. I want it like that. The Bible will never come that way. It's when you do everything according to the word of the Lord. That's when revival comes. And then he tells us, and then the water ran around about the altar. And he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, I seek and of Israel, let it be known this day that that God in Israel, the reason why you want revival is not so you'll be exalted, it's just to exalt God. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at, at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell to turn their hearts back again unto the Lord. That's the goal. That's the reason, that's the purpose of revival, turning the minds of the people back unto the Lord. And then it says in that verse 39, and they fell on their faces, and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Number five, refuse unprofitable substitutes of true revival. Refuse unprofitable substitutes of true revival. As you look at the way the uh, prophets of Baal prayed, they jumped, they screamed, they cut themselves, they demonstrated quite a lot of things, all in the flesh, all carnal. That's not revival. Refuse all the unprofitable substitutes of true revival. Number six, renew your vows and your consecration. Renew your vows and your consecration. You remember you had salvation when you were saved? You repented. You remember you were sanctified? You consecrated yourself. You remember how the Lord has now uh, brought revival in your soul, revival in your spirit? You remember how the Lord got you nearer and the fellowship was, was so intimate and so close? You had some consecrations you laid on the altar. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Jesus reign, 
Reign, Master Jesus. Reign, Master Jesus. In my soul, in my heart. Reign, Master Jesus. Jesus be the Lord of all. Jesus be the Lord of all. The kingdom of my heart. You know, it was when you put everything on the altar. In those days, that's when revival came. And if we're going to have revival today, that's still the same thing we're going to do. You renew your vow and your consecrations before the Lord. Number seven, remain in the stage of revival and readiness for the coming of the Lord. Remain in the stage of revival and readiness for the coming of the Lord. I come to point number three, practical proof of true spiritual revival. Practical proof. Of true spiritual revival. We're looking at some 85. Some 85, I'm reading from verse 6 again. In some 85, verse 6, will thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee, show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. And this is the practical proof of revival. When sinners are coming in and they are getting saved, and they are being convicted of their sins. And they are falling on their faces saying, The Lord is here indeed. When people come into our midst during our worship, during our Bible study, during our revival time. And then they cannot go away committing the same sins they were committing before. That's the practical proof. We are in a stage of true spiritual revival. And when these people are giving their lives to the Lord. And they are living righteous lives. The grace of God is becoming abundant in their lives. It says in verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. When there is interest in hearing the word of God. That's, that's when we have true revival. And when we are very early. You know, like in those days, people are coming to the Bible study and they are running. And they are running to the Bible study or they are running to the place of worship. And, uh, you know, they will stay till the end of the service and then they will pray and pray their hearts out. And without anybody telling them, pray this way or pray this way, they just, they just open their hearts and it's like spring of water coming from their heart and pouring out unto the Lord. That's a state of revival. When the people have this immeasurable interest, this unsurpassable interest, and this deep interest, and this great interest in hearing the word of the Lord. I will hear what God, the Lord, will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again unto folly. You know, when the people of God, when they hate the foolishness of sin, the foolishness of the world and the things that are childish and the things that are not spiritual. They hate the things that are carnal. When you find everybody just interested in spiritual matters and spiritual things and we're not interested in worldliness, carnality and foolishness, that's revival. That's the practical proof that the Lord, the God of revival has come into our midst. And the Lord has sent the fire of revival upon his people. Verse 9, surely his salvation is near. It's near them that fear him. When the fear of the Lord grieves our mind. And like Joseph, when the wife of Potiphar tells us to do something, our husband may not be there. Our own father, mother may not be there. Our counselor, mentor may not be there. And the people that know us and cherish us and love us may not be there. But when the fear of God is in our heart, and we can say like Joseph, no, I cannot do that, I fear God. Because even though your husband is not here, Almighty God is here. I cannot do this and sin against my God. When that fear of God is in every heart, everyone that comes over here to worship with us, and that's revival. Because it says, surely, the salvation of the Lord is near them that fear him. That the glory may dwell in our land. When we see the glory of God on one another, on each face, that's, uh, that's revival. In verse 10, mercy and truth are met together. Mercy and truth. When mercy becomes very evident in our fellowship, and truth becomes central, essential in our fellowship. Not mercy without truth, that's sentimental. Not truth without mercy, that's dry. That's dry. But when mercy and truth come together in our fellowship, we're merciful and we're truthful. And we're truth loving. And then righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Again, righteousness and peace. Not just peace. 
not just peace. You know, there are people that want peace at all costs. Peace and unrighteousness. Peace and backsliding. Peace and worldliness. Peace and carnality. And you know, they say, why don't you just leave that alone? Leave all this doctrine alone for the sake of peace. And leave all the righteousness alone for the sake of peace. And leave all this demanding lifestyle of holiness and sanctification alone because of peace. Let's just have peace. Let the people backslide. Let the people sin. Let the people do evil. But you know, if you just keep quiet at all those things, people are going to have peace. And don't you want peace? Yes, want peace. Peace and righteousness. Now, and not just righteousness without peace. You know, there are people that say, I don't care about peace. All I want is righteousness. Can you be righteous without following the Prince of Peace? It's both together in a state of revival. There will be mercy and truth joined together in the state at the time of revival. There will be righteousness and peace. They have kissed one another. And then he tells us in verse 12, Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good. You find blessings overflowing. Even without our praying too much on healing. People getting healed without even centralizing all our messages on healing. People getting delivered, people getting provided for, without, you know, asking and fasting and fasting and fasting. Oh, God bless us, oh, God do this, oh, God do that. All those blessings will be there in a state of revival. And then he tells us in that verse 13, And our land shall yield our increase, righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. That's the proof that we have revival, we will have revival we were looking at Osea chapter 14. Osea chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 4. In Osea chapter 14 verse 4. I will heal their backsliding. When backsliders are running back. And they're no, they're no more caring for the shame. You know there are backsliders you understand. They are backsliding. And they have gone away from the Lord and gone away from the church. And there's a desire in their heart. I would have, I would have liked to go back to the church. That's the church that taught me the truth of salvation. That's where I knew the very basic principles of the holiness of life. That's where I knew about the rapture and preparation readiness for the rapture. But shame is, is keeping them back. What will I say if I now show up? I've gone for a few years. If I go back now, the people say, ah, you have come back. You are not satisfied with the husks of Egypt. You are not satisfied with all those things run after in the world. But in a state of revival, all that shame is gone. And then the backsliders, the prodigal sons and daughters, they start running back. They don't care what people say. I want to go back to my roots. I want to go back to that initial fellowship. I want to go back where the power of God is moving. It says I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger is turned away from him. I will be as a deal unto Israel. He shall grow as a lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His, his branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. The people that run away and the people that went from under the authority of the word of God, that went away from the shadow of the protection of the Lord, it says they shall return. They shall revive, they shall revive, they shall revive as the corn, and grow as the vine, and the saints thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. And that's the proof that there's revival when the people of God, when we rise up once again in the joy of the Lord, and when the blessing of God overflows in our midst, and we know that the Lord is present indeed. In Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm reading from verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. And set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. And caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry there was no revival at that time and he said unto me son of man can these bones live and i answered O lord god thou knowest again he said unto me 
prophesy upon these bows and say unto them, O ye dry bows, hear the watch of the Lord. That's where it begins. If revival is going to come, a revival will come. Amen. Well, hear the watch of the Lord. O ye dry bows, in despair, in spiritual death and deadness, in weariness, desperation, hear ye the watch of the Lord. And then it says, in that same, in verse 5 now, thus says the Lord, God, unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. I said ye shall live. Amen. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring of flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. That's how revival comes. I prophesied as I was commanded. That's how revival comes. If the coordinators do not preach, proclaim, prophesy as they are commanded, uh, revival will never come. If we don't say what God wants us to say, and we only say what the people want us to say, revival will never come. If we're watching the attitude of people, the faces of people, and the receptivity of the rejection of people before we preach, revival will never come. If we're so much afraid, what will they say? If I say it like that, what, how will they react if I preach it like that? If that's, uh, if, what, that's what motivates us when we're preaching, revival will never come. If we're serving ourselves and serving the interests of the people in giving out the messages, only saying what they want to hear, revival will never come. But it is when we prophesy as the Almighty God has commanded us, as He has instructed us, He has given us the word, and we give the word to the people without mutilating it, modifying it, without adulterating it, without destroying it, without diluting it. It is when the revival will come, and thank God, revival is coming. Amen. It says in that place where I prophesied in verse 7, as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. That's revival. An exceeding great army. If we're going to be the army of the Lord, and revival is going to come. Revival of salvation. Multitudes rushing into the kingdom of God and getting saved. And the believers understanding that they need to be sanctified and made holy in heart and in life. And they are on the altar. And they are pleading and praying before the Lord. Oh Lord, sanctify us. Let the sanctifying fire, pot, purify, cleanse and sanctify us. And they are consecrating, putting everything upon the altar. And those who are holy and sanctified, we need powerful service. And we're going to the Lord. Oh Lord, we need your fire, your power once again. Because it says, uh, John baptized with water, but he shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire, not many days, hence, and you shall receive power, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth, when our interest comes into spiritual things again and we're not just, you know, satisfied there, only saved, not sanctified we're even workers, not sanctified. We're preachers, not filled with the Holy Ghost. And we can quote a few Bible passages. And since we can string those passages together, the Holy Ghost baptism is no more necessary for many of the people. But when we have the passion again, the desire again, the dream again, and the aspiration again, Lord, we want the Spirit upon us after you are sanctified. And we bring it back again. And we're not just preaching to people, just be good and just be nice and just be righteous. 
house and these definite experiences are laid line upon line. Get saved, get sanctified, and get spirit filled. And the Lord is actually doing that. And when the Lord is doing that, and we're hearing testimony there, I was saved. I hear testimony there, God helped me. I went to make my restitution. And we have testimony there, God helped me. Now my life is righteous. Our family has changed. No more anger, no more fighting. It's now love and fellowship and forgiveness in our family. That's what we're looking for, and that's what will happen. I said that's what will happen. But if that is going to happen, we're going to call upon the name of the Lord and we're going to rise up a great army. And the Lord is saying, this is the time. This is the time we're going to seek the face of the Lord. You rise up now. We want revival in this church. We want revival in this church. And revival will start in the leadership. The revival will start among the workers. The heart cry of the believer for revival. There must be a desire. There must be a desire. There must be a desire. There must be a desperation. A desperation for revival. Oh Lord, this is what we need. We pour our hearts out unto the Lord. We pour out our hearts before the Lord. A great desire. A great desperation. And a demand. A demand. We are asking, oh Lord, help us. Send that revival upon us. We want to see the good old days again. The Lord has crowned you King of glory. King of peace. Prince of power. Reign in my heart and reign in my life. Jesus, I surrender all. Jesus, I surrender all. All the kingdoms of my heart and life, I surrender all. Renew your voice, renew your consecration before the Lord. All to thee. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. What are you pulling away from the altar? What are you taking away from your consecration? Lay everything back at the altar again. Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I want to serve you. All my heart, all my soul, all my mind. I lay everything down. I will serve you without reservation. I will serve you without looking back. I will serve you without regret. I will serve you without looking at what other people are doing or what other people are not doing. I renew my vow. I renew my consecration before the Lord. He wants you to serve Him. He wants you to serve Him. With all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. And He wants us to so live a sincere life. Life without hypocrisy. Life without insincerity. Life without covetousness. Life without worldliness. Life without carnality. And after he has revived us, he wants us to remain in a state of revival. He wants us to remain. In that state of revival, he wants us to remain in that state of revival and in the state of readiness, readiness for the rapture, readiness for the second coming of Christ, following the Lord, serving the Lord with all sincerity, serving the Lord. In righteousness and holiness all the days of our lives. Serving the Lord. Without taking anything away from the altar of consecration. Pray that the Lord will give you the power. To be a soul winner. Will give you the power. To reach out to the people who are perishing. Make other people that do not know the Lord 
to know the Lord through your preaching, through your evangelism, through your testimony, through the life that you live in the power, in the spirit of the Lord. That once again, the presence of the Lord will be mighty and permanent in your life. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God, third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to stay out for a I just thank God for all his provision. I just bless you.